Okay, so this is going to be chapter four in week two. The learning objectives for chapter four will be to define the key terms in this chapter, to understand the definition and classifications of law in relation to dentistry, understand the important terms involved in litigation, understand crimes and torts with regard to the standard of care in a dental office, understand the Dental Practice Act, discuss professional standards that dental assisting and dental hygiene use for accreditation, certification, and licensure, describe codes of ethics and other professional guidelines of dental organizations, discuss the ethical and legal considerations for the dental hygienist, the assistant, and the administrative assistant, explain various types of consent, understand managed care and risk management pro uh, programs as they relate to dentistry, understand the legal responsibilities of a dental practice, list the business office activities that could lead to potential litigation, including abandonment, fraud, records management, defamation of character, negligence, invasion of privacy, and responsibilities with regard to Good Samaritan laws and the American uh, Americans with Disabilities Act and computer security. Understand how legal responsibilities guide dental team members in communication with patients and colleagues, record keeping and documentation, and enhance risk management in the dental office setting. Understand the importance of a respectful work climate to support a professional work environment and to prevent patient and colleague harassment, bullying, and disruptive behavior, and identify six steps in making ethical decisions. Okay, so chapter four is all about the legal regulations in dentistry. We're going to compare the professional and the legal regulations. Um, I know you guys took law and ethics, so sort of just consider chapter four to be a very good review. Um, here we're going to be talking about the standards for dental care, which arise from both common law, which and uh, the judicial decisions, and the statutory law, which are enacted by a legislative body. The dental professional is also governed by voluntary standards, like the principles of ethics uh, developed and implemented by the dental profession itself. Um, your book does talk about membership in a professional organization being voluntary and therefore the standards of those organizations are considered voluntary. Um, you might remember whenever COVID started, um, the ADHA and the ADA both came out um, probably the very first week of March, if not the end of February, saying that uh, dental offices should stop seeing patients. Um, however, because the uh, Texas State Board of Dental Examiners had not yet come out saying um, that we needed to halt procedures, uh, you know, the uh, routine procedures, then we didn't stop. Um, it wasn't until the Texas State Board, which is our uh, legal regulating body, came out and said that we needed to, uh, you know, halt uh, dental procedures that, uh, that most offices actually shut down at that point. Um, so both legal and voluntary requirements and standards are implemented for the protection of society and ultimately the patient, right? We, we treat the society by treating individual patients. Um, standards that are established by the professional organization, um, they are voluntary, but most of the time they're used as a guide um, and for a peer review and quality assurance. So if you are providing the standard of care, then that's going to be your legal um, obligation. But the professional organization might step in and say that, you know, we could go one further and, and provide this other sort of, you know, service. And that is the service that we might all strive for. Um, and then also when the regulating body, you know, comes back around and says they're, they're going to, you know, edit their regulations, then they're going to use the professional association's recommendations and guidelines as a, mm, a sort of like an advice. They, they look to see what those professional organizations are publishing and how, um, how they all feel about those guidelines.
If you look in your book, you can see in figure 4.1, there is a diagram of the professional and the legal regulations of dentistry, which we're also going to look at together. So the definition of law is uh, a law is consisting of enforceable rules governing relationships among individuals and between individuals and their society. So a law is basically something that you have to do, otherwise there will be consequences for not doing them. Uh, a broad definition of the law implies that there must be established rules and judicial decisions. There has to be written down somewhere that it is a law. So laws relative to dentistry, this is where the Texas State Board of Dentistry steps in, and they have the responsibility of enforcing laws within the agency, and they have the responsibility of making the rules and regulations that conform to those enacted laws. So the Texas State Board sits down and looks at the occupational code, and they, you know, they write out everything that is supposed to regulate dentistry, dental hygienists, dental assistants, uh, dental technicians, everybody, everybody in dentistry. They sit down and write the rules. They also write into law what happens to you if you break those rules. And they are the ones that are tasked with um, enforcing them. So if you break um, a occupational code law, then they will be the one that uh, that pursue and investigate and uh, and ultimately will you know, if you did something wrong, then they would be the ones to remove your licensure. Um, they're also the ones that give you a licensure. So they're, they're the ones that are tasked with taking it. Um, the rules and regulations adopted by the board are components of the body of law referred to as administrative law. Uh, state statutes have to conform to the state's constitution and the U.S. Constitution. So uh, a state couldn't allow you know, a dental hygienist to do something that uh, that the U.S. Uh, federal law says hygienists can't do, although typically the federal law doesn't step in on those kinds of things. OK, so here is how all of that works. Um, society representing, you know, everyone who wants to work in dentistry. Right. And then everything is cut off right here. OK, all of this is law. This all says these are the things you must do in order to not be breaking the law. OK, these are things that you should do. Should this is hard to write with a mouse. Sorry, looks terrible. Um, so these are all the things that you should do in order to be the best professional that you can be. Right. These are all things that you must do in order to meet the minimum requirement. Now, from here up, things are pretty straightforward. These are legal re uh, regulations, and then you have your professional standards, right? Um, the Texas State Board, for us, is the one that regulates these laws. They are the ones who, who uh, you know, change the laws periodically. They are the ones who uh, enforce these laws. Over here, we have things like ADHA, uh, ADA, um, CODA even is going to be over here, right down here with the accreditation of educational programs. So from here up, things are pretty straightforward. Things are pretty separate, right? These are things that we should be doing, right? And these are the things that we have to do. However, from this line down, things get a little squirrely, right? We go a little back and forth. So. According to the Texas State Board, you have to be licensed. You have to go to a school that is CODA accredited. But CODA accredited is over here, right? So CODA mandates the standards that they feel that an educational program should meet. And then whether or not you meet those is how you would be eligible for licensure. However, you would not necessarily have to meet these things if it were just up to the Texas State Board. But because the Texas State Board says, OK, well, we're not going to write out every single thing that CODA has already written out. We're just going to let CODA speak for themselves. And so they say, as long as you, you know, uh, graduate from a CODA accredited school, then you're going to be eligible for your licensure. So licensure itself kind of goes both ways, right? It is both something you have to meet the standards of practice through the um, 
the you know professional standards and the, the professional organizations but then over here you have to be licensed in order to meet the law so it, it's on both sides right and then quality assurance comes from both of these as well so if you're licensed that means you met both the professional standards and you met all of the legal requirements in order to become licensed and then by being licensed and meeting all of those requirements that is how they know that you have the capability to practice uh, with a quality uh, assurance and then all of that is going to help the patient the the public is protected because of these legal ramp like legal regulations and then um, the professional association makes sure that you are a good provider and both of those things go toward helping your patient Okay, so there's two classifications of law. There is civil law, which relates to duties between persons or between citizens and their government. And then you have criminal law, which relates to wrongs committed against the public as a whole. Laws are always separated into these two different classifications. Okay, so litigation is the process in which a plaintiff brings a lawsuit against a defendant. The person or the party that institutes the suit in court is the plaintiff, the person who brings the charges forward to the court. They say, I have been wronged somehow. The person who is being accused of the wrongdoing is the defendant. It's pretty easy to remember because the defendant defends themselves. So during litigation proceedings, there is a fact witness that will sometimes, they're, they're not always there, but they will bring forth fact witnesses that provide firsthand knowledge of facts or events. They were there, they saw the things happening. The, um, so they bring forth firsthand knowledge concerning what they saw or did during a specific act. Whereas an expert witness um, they give an opinion regarding whether the standard of care was breached based on his or her educational background and strong expertise. So an expert witness is not someone who was there. It's, it's never someone who was there. This person is just someone who has education, uh, a, a very good education in whatever the topic is and they are able to provide information to the court or to the to the judge um, based on 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 their education but they don't they're, they're never there just because it says witness doesn't mean they're there uh, so crimes and torts these are are two separate things so a crime is a wrongdoing and it's against the society as a whole typically it involves uh, the performance of a prohibited act with a specific state of mind or intent these can be either misdemeanors or felonies the crime is a wrongdoing against the public at large and is prosecuted by a public official a person or entity that breaks those laws can be guilty of a crime regardless of whether there was intent. You don't have to intend to commit a crime in order for a crime to be committed. The misdemeanor is the less serious of the two. It's less serious than a felony. It's typically punishable by like a, a fine or imprisonment of up to a year, but not usually more than a year. A felony is a more serious crime and is usually punishable by more than a year of prison. So a tort is a civil wrongdoing, and this is a breach of a legal duty. It's usually reso uh, resolved with monetary compensation. Torts can be unintentional or intentional acts of wrongdoing. Uh, these will include um, assault and battery, defamation of character, invasion of privacy, immoral conduct, fraud, um, unintentional torts do not require a particular mental state, so you can you can be completely sane and still commit an unint unintentional tort. Uh, failure to exercise a standard of care is an example of an unintentional tort. Okay, so one of the forms of tort is negligence. This one is typically unintentional tort that includes the following four elements. All four elements have to be present in order for a, uh, a case of negligence to be filed. So 
a duty exists to follow a standard of care. You are a hygienist, you're mandated to follow the standard of care. This duty was breached. At some point, you did not follow the standard of care. The plaintiff suffered an injury. Your patient was harmed because of you. That injury was a direct result of that breach of duty. So that patient, whatever service you failed to provide, hurt that patient, okay? Negligence is the performance of an act that a reasonably careful person under similar circumstances would not do, or the failure to perform an act that a reasonably careful person would do under similar circumstances. So the, the caveat here is that a reasonably careful person either would or would not do something. And you are expected to perform the same services to, to conduct yourself and behave the same way as a reasonably careful person. And that is how they will judge whether or not you did something wrong. Um, the, the importance here is that it's, it's a standard of care. Um, if you are providing a standard of care and the patient is harmed through you providing that standard of care, that's not a breach here. That's not negligence. Okay. So let's say you're scaling and root planning and you have an eight millimeter pocket and you're, you're doing the best you can and you, uh, the, you know, conduct um, unintentional gingival curatage, right? You don't mean to do it, but it, it happens, right? It's, it's unintentional, but you did so through following that standard of care. You're using all the right tools. You have all of the right equipment, but unfortunately due to, you know, the shape of the tooth and all of that, you could not help but open too far and unintentionally scrape the, the gingival sulcus, right? So that is not negligence. That's you harming the patient, sure, because of gingival curatage, um, but you were following the standard of care and the duty was not breached, even though the patient suffered an injury, that's not negligence. This would be more so if you uh, were seeing a patient, you provided a prophy, and then the next week it turns out that patient had had an eight millimeter pocket at one point, and you should have provided localized scaling, right, on that eight millimeter pocket, because there's no way you provide a prophy on an eight millimeter pocket, right? Your standard of care is to do scaling on that, right? Um, you failed to do the scaling on that eight millimeter pocket. The patient now has a 10 millimeter pocket, which has spread further around the tooth. The patient has suffered an injury because they did not receive care. And then it, it only got worse because you failed to do your job. So that is negligence and it has to have all four of those. Potential negligent acts in the dental office include abandonment, burns, mistaken identity, material left in patients after surgical procedures, defects in equipment, failure to observe patient reactions and take appropriate action, extracting the wrong tooth. That one's probably not a hygienist problem. Um, so in your book, in box 4.1, there is a complete list of negligent acts that could occur in a dental office. You should probably take a look at those. Okay, so another form of tort is malpractice. Malpractice is considered a form of negligence, but it can also refer to any professional misconduct, evil practice, or illegal or immoral conduct. Malpractice can either be unintentional or intentional. We hear malpractice a lot in medical sort of terms. People get malpractice insurance, right? Professionals usually consider malpractice a form of negligence, but it can mean in a broader sense, any wrongdoing by a professional. Okay, so the Dental Practice Act defines the minimum educational standards, the requirements for credentialing, and the criteria for license revocation or suspension for a dentist, a dental hygienist, and in some states, the dental assistant. Legal standards in dental law are for the protection of the public and requirements differ from state to state. The, uh, I'm sorry, many state dental practice acts define conditions under which the assistant or the hygienist can perform specific duties. You cannot perform anything outside of your scope of practice. So each state provides a list of definitions within the law and the descriptive language may vary 
and significantly from state to state. Uh, patients of record refers to a patient who has been examined and diagnosed by a licensed dentist and whose treatment has been planned by that dentist. Assignment commonly refers to the dentist assigning a specific procedure to a dental assistant or hygienist that is to be performed on a designated patient of record. In some jurisdictions for certain procedures, the dentist does not need to be physically present in the office or the treatment room at the same time that the procedure is being performed. I know you guys understand general, direct, um, and indirect Supervision, right? Supervision refers to the conditions under which a patient of record may be treated by an assistant or hygienist and the protocol to be performed after the treatment is rendered. So Dental Practice Act, the legal requirements necessary to practice dentistry and the scope of what can be practiced are developed through legislative action in each state and are identified in the State Dental Practice Act. To completely understand the scope of practice and supervisory requirements, carefully read all definitions and describe descriptions in the Dental Practice Act. It does not matter what the ADHA, say, the ADHA says on their website about what you can do in Texas. What matters is what the Texas State Occupational Code says you can do in the state of Texas. Okay, so be careful with those kinds of things. Here we are, professional standards. So accreditation is the process in which an educational program is evaluated and recognized by an outside agency for having attained a predetermined set of standards. Here in the United States, in dentistry, the Commission on Dental Accreditation, or CODA, of the American Dental Association, the ADA, is responsible for accrediting educational programs in dentistry, dental assisting, dental hygiene, and dental laboratory technology. Certification requires a course of education and clinical experience. Certification measures whether the person has met certain criteria established by a non-governmental organization. Licensure is the credential granted an individual by the state after he or she meets those necessary requirements. Okay, so you could become certified, but then if you're not eligible through that certification by other means, then you don't get licensed, right? They're two separate things. Requirements for licensure may include a written or a clinical examination. Obviously in dental hygiene, we know it includes both of these things. This book is really meant for dental assisting. So credentialing is a generic term that refers to the ways in which professionals can measure and maintain their competence. Um, this isn't necessarily a word we, we spend too much time with in hygiene because we get licensed. Um, the processes used in credentialing include accreditation, certification, and licensure. So accreditation is what the school has in order to um, you know, prove that you met those re requirements. So the school is accredited by CODA saying that our program has been looked at by CODA and the CODA said yes. The students who go through this coursework and meet these requirements are eligible to become dental hygienists. Certification is what happens for dental assistants, um, but when you leave our school, you'll have a diploma, and that diploma is sort of like a certification that says you do know how to do all of these things, right? And then you apply with your certification uh, for licensure. Certification is not usually a word we use too often in, in hygiene, it's something more assistants use, but uh, you know, it exists, so might as well talk about it. Okay, code of ethics. So ethics in daily professional practice challenges a practitioner to differentiate between right and wrong. Every health professional has to realize that both right and wrong actions can be taken, and there's no right way to do a wrong thing. Ethics is the branch of philosophy and a systematic intellectual approach to the standards of behavior. A professional code of ethics helps members of the profession achieve high levels of behavior through moral consciousness, decision making, and practice by members of the profession. I think it's important to note that ethics and ethical behavior are not always perfectly in line with the law. So while the law says we can do something, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's ethical to do that. Um, don't forget that, that laws are made up 
by people and they're made up during a certain time and so you know while slavery was once not against the law that didn't make it ethical okay so so yes you know laws are great um at, at helping to enforce certain ethical behaviors um ethics goes further than laws and it's it's deeper than than laws are um, okay, so ADA principles of ethics and code of professional conduct. So there are codes that are based on ethical principles that reflect a concern for the patient's protection during all aspects of care. You can look in your book in uh, box 4.2 uh, for an overview of the ADA principles of ethics and the code of professional conduct. Um, like the ADA, uh, the ADHA has addressed the issue of ethics by preparing a statement regarding the principles of ethics for its members. If you go to uh, the ADHA's website, there is um, the, the code of ethics uh, sort of pledge that you can take. Um, the purpose of the ADHA code of ethics is to provide guidance for the achievement of high levels of ethical consciousness, decision-making, and practice by the members of the profession. Um, even though you may not become an American, you know, you might not join the American Dental Hygienist Association, um, that doesn't mean that you should disregard its code of ethics because um, it's based on every hygienist, not just members of a professional organization. So, you know, whether or not you want to spend the money to join the association, um, which in, in my opinion is worth it, um, is, is up to you. But um, that doesn't mean that its values have any less merit. Ethical and legal considerations for the administrative assistant. Okay, so we're talking about assistance now. Vigilance. The administrative assistant must be constantly vigilant about changes that take place in the law affecting dentistry. Um, this is also applicable for hygienists. It is your job to maintain um, a constant updated knowledge about the laws that come out. It's a good idea to uh, have the Texas State Board of Dental Examiners send you emails. Um, you know, when you're applying for licensure, um, you can always unsubscribe to those emails, but I think that would be doing yourself a disservice um, because it's your job to maintain those. Um, just within the last few years, there have been several changes that have happened uh, based on how to uh, become licensed, how to, uh, you know, renew your license, um, and the continuing education that you are required to take in order to be eligible for licensure. So um, it's a good idea to, to have some sort of connection. If you join the ADHA, they will um, absolutely send you emails regarding all of this stuff. I know this because I'm the secretary and I always have to send out emails when something new comes out. <laughs> um, so ethical and legal decisions may change as laws and societal influences affect the delivery of dental care, right? CODA made a huge dent in dental hygiene and, um, and it, it changed a lot of things about the way that we practiced um, care in 2020. So um, it's it's pretty important that we keep up to date with all of those things. If you look in your book, uh, box 4.4 .4, to examine common business activities that may lead to potential litigation. Ethical and legal considerations again. Okay, so the next step is gonna be the assignment of duties. The licensed dentist is responsible for assigning specific procedures to dental auxiliaries. Hygienists and assistants are both dental auxiliaries. So before assigning duties to staff members, the dentist should review the appropriate credentials. This means, does the person I'm assigning this to, are they um, certified to do this? And then retain the staff member's credentials on file. So if you get some sort of extra certification, your dentist should have a copy of that uh, certification and keep it in your personnel file. And then avoid employer-employee conflict in the assignment. Um, the typical example of this is when um, a dentist tries to delegate a duty that you are not qualified to perform. So for instance, if your office has nitrous and your dentist uh, delegates for you, the dental hygienist in the state of Texas, to administer nitrous, 
that is beyond your scope of practice and it is not legal for you to do that. It is legal for you to shut off the nitrous and to give them just oxygen, but it is not legal for you to increase the amount of nitrous given. The dentist is the only person who can increase the amount of nitrous given, right? But maybe they're busy and your patient doesn't have enough nitrous. And you know, the dentist says, you know, you can just go ahead and do that. Well, no, you can't just go ahead and do that, okay? So, so keep those kinds of things in mind. Um, if the duty that is illegal in the state is assigned to that auxiliary, the dentist is the one liable for this illegal action because they've delegated you something that you cannot do. Furthermore, if the assistant or the hygienist performs that procedure that is not legally delegable to be performed, then the auxiliary is responsible, okay? So if they tell you to touch the nitrous, then that's on them. But if you touch the nitrous, that's on you. The assistant, the administrative assistant, and all dental auxiliaries have to be up to date on the scope of practice. They have to understand what can be delegated by the dentist um, to those particular staff members. Okay, so next up is consent. Consent is the voluntary acceptance or agreement of what is planned or done by another person to deliver, sorry, the deliver, <laughs> I think I should say delivery, of dental care involves two forms of consent, informed and implied. Unauthorized touching without the patient's consent is considered battery. So battery is contact with someone that results in bodily harm or offensive touching. If they don't want you to touch them and you touch them, you have committed battery. Assault is different. So you know how assault and battery always kind of go hand in hand. Assault is when you threaten to touch them, but you have not touched them. They feel threatened by your threat. So that is assault. If you actually touch them in in the way that they felt threatened by then that is battery okay don't get those two confused so slide one of three informed consent um, every adult of sound mind has the right to determine what can and cannot be done with his or her body to be legally valid consent must be informed and given freely and the patient must be an adult of sound mind so um, sound mind here being, you know, said twice, that's pretty important, right? Sound mind means that they are old enough to make this decision and they are uh, fully informed of what is going on and they are mentally capable of making the decision. So if the patient has some sort of mental handicap, then they are not of sound mind. They are not legally able to give consent. Also, someone of sound mind, uh, who isn't of sound mind, would be someone under the influence of alcohol or drugs um, or severe stress that may not have the, the you know, current sufficient cap uh, capacity to give consent. So just like consent works, you know, when you're talking about consent of a sexual nature, um, you know, if the person is under the influence of some other kind of, of intoxicant, then they're not able to give consent. The same thing works for your patient in your office. If your patient is drunk and they, you know, appear to be not able to make decisions, um, then, then they're not able to make decisions. Okay, so informed consent also includes um, these elements in order to be considered informed consent. So first up, it has to be freely given. You cannot coerce someone into consenting to something. Um, information about the procedure, the treatment and diagnosis has to be made in understandable language. If your patient doesn't understand what you're asking them to consent to, then they cannot consent to it, right? They have to be able to get, understand what they're, they're saying yes to. Risks and benefits, estimate of success, alternatives, options, and prognosis for no treatment also need to be discussed. So the patient needs to understand what happens if they get the treatment, but they also need to be informed what happens if they don't get the treatment. Because sometimes patients will look at what happens and they'll say, oh yeah, I don't wanna deal with that. I'm gonna stay where I'm at. I'm okay where I'm at, you know? But then they don't realize that where they're at is, 
is going to get worse if they don't have the treatment. Okay, so you have to give them both scenarios. Then the patient has the right to ask questions, and they have that right to ask questions before they give consent. Sometimes they'll wait until after. They'll say yes, and then you know you'll have the paper signed, and then you know you start the treatment, and then suddenly they're like, "Well, what about this?" And you're like, "Okay, we just uh, we just talked about that, you know." But they are allowed to ask questions at any time. It's preferable if they ask questions before they give consent, uh, but if they give consent and then they ask questions, they always have the right to withdraw consent. They always get to say, I changed my mind, I don't wanna do this. Um, courts and legislatures have defined specific elements, these, these specific elements, uh, to describe informed consent. If these conditions are not met, the dentist may be liable for battery or negligence. So if they do something and the patient feels like they didn't give consent for whatever was done to them, they could be charged for battery. If they didn't do something and the patient feels like they didn't understand that they were, you know, refusing something, then they can be considered negligent. So it just depends on on the conditions of that individual case. Okay. Further continuing with informed consent um, is going to be about a minor. So when the minor is treated only a parent or a guardian can grant consent. That means no grandparents, no babysitters, and no siblings. Unless one of these has been court ordered the guardian of that minor, they cannot give consent, okay? Parents can authorize another party to grant consent for treatment during their absence, but this has to be done before treatment. So like in our office, we have those forms that are signed saying that the patient or the, the parent agrees to let you make the decisions in that office based on these criteria. Um, and these are the only criteria that we could possibly perform, um, then they're allowed to give that. But it has to be done before the treatment is given. Um, specialty practices like endodontics and oral surgery have forms that are specifically designed for their disciplines. Of course, you're going to get consent in uh, the for the form that you're going to actually do the service for. So anyway, um, go in your book for figure 4.2 to see an example of what a consent form for a general practice might look like. Okay, so express consent. This is different from informed consent. So this is achieved when a dentist prepares a treatment plan, writes it down, presents it to the patient, and presents the patient with a copy to sign after providing a description of satisfactory informed consent. So when we give our patient all of the information and they agree to it, and then they sign their name saying that they agreed to it, you keep a copy, they keep a copy, that is express consent. It is fully laid out, the train has left the station, express consent, okay? The element of informed consent has to be met in order for you to get express consent, okay? The dentist also has to verbally describe the treatment plan and the patient has to verbally agree to it. So the verbal agreement, that is informed consent, right? Where the patient says yes, the dentist gives all the information, but when they write it down, that's express. Implied. This one is the one that I always felt makes things unclear. <laughs> but implied consent is a little interesting. So implied consent is based on the actions of the patient and the provider. Accepting a patient for treatment indicates that the dentist agrees to accept certain responsibilities, right? So by accepting a new patient, the patient comes in, you do an exam, you are now accepting uh, the responsibility of providing the standard of care to that patient. When the patient agrees to accept treatment, the patient also resumes uh, sorry, assumes responsibilities. So they come in, they accept treatment, they understand that means now I'm gonna have to lay in this chair, I'm gonna have to wear this bib, I'm gonna have to uh, you know, wear these glasses. They understand that all of those things go along with accepting responsibility uh, for uh, having the treatment done for you. And then in your book, you can look for boxes 4.5 and 4.6 um, to see that list of implied responsibilities. 
Um, so implied consent is agreements that flow automatically from the relationship between the patient and the dental professional. Implied consent consent responsibilities are twofold. Those the dentist owes the patient and those that the patient owes to the dentist. Um, there is a classic example that a patient who comes into your office, sits down in your chair, lays back in the chair, and opens their mouth, that is implied consent in a lot of, of ways. Um, the patient was not coerced to come into your office that day. They were not coerced to go into the back and lay in the chair. They were not coerced to lean back when the chair was laid back, and they were not coerced to open their mouth. They have the ability to keep their mouth closed if they want to. So in this way, implied consent is not always mm, clear, right? They may have implied consent for some type of treatment, but then if you did not get informed and express consent for the specific treatment that you provided, they could still sue you for that, okay? So be careful when you're relying on implied consent. Informed refusal. So this goes right along with informed consent, right? Except that they're not consenting, they're refusing. So the patient may decline a recommended procedure or referral from an office or from a dentist. The office needs to document this referral for recommended care in writing. So, excuse me, the dentist recommends, you know, you need a sealant. And then the patient says, or the patient's mom says, no, uh, we don't want sealants. Um, you know, they don't, they have a BPA or whatever it is. And so then they leave. Well, six months later, they come back and they say, my kid has a cavity um, and you never told me anything about that. And it's like, well, we recommended sealants and here is where you signed saying you refused to have sealants for them. That is how this works. So examples of informed refusal like of radiographs, periodontal care, fluoride treatments, or referral um, to a specialist or a physician. Those are all refusals that the patient can refuse, um, but it will change the way that you treat that patient. There are some things like radiographs where um, there is a standard of care that the office is mandated to meet. And if they do not meet that standard of care, then they are negligent, right? So. If your office recommends x-rays and your patient refuses and you don't take x-rays, but you still see that patient, that is negligence. Whether or not the patient refused and signed the form saying that they refused, a patient cannot agree to negligent care, okay? They can, it doesn't matter how informed they are, they cannot consent to having negligent care. So it would be up to the office to dismiss that patient based on their requirements. That is where you step in and you say, if you cannot do this service, which is the standard of care, then I cannot provide any services for you because then I'm operating beneath the standard of care and that's on my license, okay? When they sign a paper saying they don't want x-rays, that piece of paper is not going to hold up in court, okay? Don't trust it. Um, and so the dentist, the patient, and a witness, such as the administrative assistant, should sign the dated information, uh, the dated informed refusal form. Not all courts recognize informed refusal, but documentation, sorry, documentation is helpful for defending against allegations of negligence. So yes, you can have the form that says that they refused, and then they came back later and said that they, uh, you know, that they have a problem now um, and it's a direct you know responsibility of you having not performed the service that you said you sh that they should have they said no to um it, it's you're less likely to be held to the same uh negligent sort of reprimand like the uh, repercussions um as you would if you had not had that form signed Managed care. So managed care refers to a cost containment system of healthcare insurance. 
Managed care systems raise several legal and ethical issues for the dentist and the healthcare professional. To protect the patient's interest, the dentist must be relied on to adhere to both legal and ethical principles. The passage of the Affordable Care Act and expansion of Medicaid have resulted in an increasing number of dental service organizations or DSOs that are being created. Um, limitations imposed by managed care companies generally are directed at payment for services, but the policies also limit the actual services a patient may receive. What this means is insurance. Sometimes insurance will dictate the type of treatment that the dentist can or should provide, and then the patient and the dentist are obligated to sort of make up the difference for what the patient actually needs. Um, there are a lot of agreements between dentists and insurance companies in order to provide services to patients who need them, but that the insurance company is not willing to pay for. Um, that's what they're talking about here. Managed care is a cost containment system of healthcare insurance. Risk management programs. So risk management programs primarily highlight examples of activities in which dentists are found liable to prevent and reduce the risk of malpractice claims. Risk management programs may also address compliance issues and obligations established by the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, HIPAA. Risk management education combined with competent practice reduces the potential for allegations of malpractice leading to litigation. So if you follow the rules, risk management rules, right, then you will reduce the potential for malpractice claims. Risk management programs aid the dental professional in identifying, analyzing, and dealing with risks in the dental office. These topics include information on operating safety, product safety, quality assurance, and waste disposal. Okay, so abandonment. Abandonment is when the dentist, for a certain reason, will end the professional relationship with the patient. Um, and the patient still needs to be in uh, need of care and, um, and proper transfers or referrals. So basically, for a case to work, the dentist has to end the relationship and the patient still has a need of some kind, right? Um, a dentist patient relationship can end for a couple of reasons. So uh, to prevent those claims of abandonment, this is how you have to go about that. You have to send a letter to the patient indicating the date that that relationship will end, offering to provide uh, emergency care before the date of the termination, and then directing the patient to a different either local society or clinic of some kind to, uh, I'm sorry, for provider referrals. So the administrative assistant is usually the one who will, you know, send the letter um, and they're the ones who answer the phone whenever the patient calls in. Um, and so if you're speaking with someone for whatever reason that the dentist has decided to um, um, no longer see them, then you have to be really careful when you're talking to your patients um, after that letter of termination has been forwarded. So the office does not get to change its mind. You don't get to say, oh, we're not gonna see you anymore, and then the patient complains, and then you give, right? If you if you send them a letter, it has to be for sure. Um, the only thing that you're really supposed to say to that patient is whatever was in the letter. So sometimes what happens is that um, a patient will no-show on you several times, right? Um, you're not necessarily abandoning your patient as long as you're still allowing them to like come in for walk-ins or if you um, um, are still willing to see them but you're no longer letting them schedule that's that's not the same thing um, that is abandonment is if the patient calls and says they're in severe pain um, they need to be seen as soon as possible um, for an emergency and then you are like, uh, yeah, no, um, you know, we're here, we're not doing anything, but we're not going to see you because of, you know, whatever reason, right? Um, it needs to be 
a very formal thing. So let's say a patient is improper with someone in the office. That is within the dentist's right to like terminate that relationship with the patient and let the patient know in writing, hey, because of your conduct, uh, we're no longer going to be seeing you at this office. We'll see you up until this date. Um, from then on, um, you know, we're more than happy to send your information wherever you'd like to go. Here are a couple of places that might take you and that will be the end of this. And then the patient gets to make that decision of where to go after that. But either way, they can't come back to you. Abandonment is if, you didn't do all of those things. You just straight up stop seeing the patient. The patient wants to come in and you didn't give them a letter and tell them why and go through the process of, of like terminating that relationship. Um, fraud. Fraud is when you deliberately practice uh, to secure unfair or unlawful gain, right? This happens a lot with insurance. So um, there's a lot of different ways you can commit insurance fraud. Um, and we'll probably talk about those kinds of things in dental office management when we talk about insurance claims. Um, this is not usually something a hygienist has to worry about. Um, but the most common kind of fraud in dentistry is obtaining fees from an insurance provider who either you didn't provide the service the same way that you said that you did, or you, um, or you, you, you just didn't provide the service at all, or you provided a different type of service and you're claiming it as something else that they'll cover, right? You can't do that. So let's say, you know, your patient has a gingivitis therapy and you perform a gingivitis therapy on your patient, but you only bill them out as a prophy, that would be considered fraud, okay? records management. So um, <clears throat> the individual responsible for documentation, that's usually the office manager or an administrative assistant, right? They are the people who are responsible for managing the actual records. But as you know, hygienists, dentists, and assistants are the ones responsible for uh, putting in individual documentation for the services that are provided, right? Um, that documentation needs to include the exact date, the type of treatment that was provided, any materials that were used, any complications, any special notations about the treatment, and anything bad that happened, right? Either, you know, patient didn't tolerate well or patient did, right? You have to write all that stuff down. You guys know all of that. Um, if the patient has any comments or questions or if they reacted a certain way that maybe a reasonable person wouldn't have reacted that way, then you also need to record that, but it needs to be in a very objective manner, okay? You can't write, you know, the patient was mean today. <laughs> don't, don't write stuff like that, right? You know, the patient um, appeared upset because of this reason. Patient stated this. Um, don't, don't write things that are your opinion, okay? Uh, nothing can be more valuable in defending against that potential litigation than very clear, concise records. Um, I worked in an office uh, with a dentist for five years and he was sued once for um, oral cancer. Um, the patient, you know, left and, and um, found out he had oral cancer and then sued my dentist for having not found it at a, an appropriate amount of time. And it turned out that the hygienist, now it was, this was before, before me, but the hygienist had in one of the notes written that, you know, the lesion looked like this um, and that they discussed going to have a referral for it. Um, and so my dentist, um, you know, wasn't in the wrong at all. Um, and so he was pretty funny after that about documenting uh, lesions, but, um, um, clear notes. They are going to save you from these kinds of things. Be thorough, be accurate, and be objective. Um, that's that's going to be the best thing that saves you. It's, it's usually not something that's going to happen right away, too. I think we've talked about that, but usually you write a note, everything is fine, um, and then 10 years from now, you don't remember writing the note, you don't remember the patient, you've moved on to, you know, two other offices, and then you get a letter in the mail saying that you have to come in and be seen, okay? It, that's how it works. That's why notes are so important because there's no way you're going to remember any of these people. Um, you know, when you're in school, you only see, you know, several people, you remember all of them. But um, unfortunately, it's, it's not that way in private practice. You forget everyone. Six months later, you can't remember their name. 
it that's that's just how it is. You just see too many people. Defamation of character is the communication of false information to a third party about a person that results in injury to that person's reputation. Okay, so this is um, either slander, which is said verbally, or it's libel, which is when you write something down about that person. Um, a dental professional should make statements about a patient or other professional only as they relate to the rendering of dental care and only to other dental care providers involved in that care. This is why uh, there's kind of a, it's, it's not really an unwritten rule um, about not saying negative things about patients' previous dental providers because you weren't there. You don't know what happened, okay? Maybe it's mostly the patient's fault and you don't know and you're gonna say something negative about a different provider based on what you see that day when you have no idea what happened before. So it is almost always a good idea to not say a single bad thing about anyone else ever. <laughs> Okay, negligence. So we talked about negligence a little already, but to prove negligence, the patient, the patient has to show, sorry, the plaintiff has to show that there was an obligation to provide care according to a specified standard, right? There is a standard of care that you are obligated to meet. There was a failure to meet that standard. The failure to meet that standard was what led to injury and the fact um, and that there was, in fact, an actual injury to the patient. Okay, so negligence is failure to do something a reasonably prudent or reasonably careful person would do, or doing something that a reasonably prudent or reasonably careful person would not do. In most states, uh, when a dentist is found negligent, the adverse act is reported to the National Practitioner Data Bank the NPDB, National Practitioner Data Bank, um, which is a central sort of collection uh, repository for collecting and releasing information on professional, com um, sorry, professional competence and conduct. That repository includes information on paid malpractice claims and adverse reports of healthcare licensees. So when a claim is made, typically it's made to the state where that dentist or hygienist is a provider in, right? Um, but you cannot then just move to Minnesota because you don't want that to be on your record anymore, okay? It's gonna go into the National Practitioner Data Bank and it's going to follow you wherever you go. Um, there was a case of a dentist who was, um, um, I can't remember exactly what he was doing, but it was pretty egregious. Um, I think he was either reusing needles or he was doing something really inappropriate. And, um, he gets caught in this act, he loses his license, um, and he's not eligible because in the United States there's a National Practitioner Data Bank. He's not eligible for uh, getting a license in any other state. So he moves, I think it was to Argentina, and uh, he tries to get a license there. He gets a license, gets all set up, he's got everything going for him, and then it finally catches him like as he's starting practice. So. Um, these kinds of things don't go away. If you lose your license based on uh, negligence or some kind of, uh, of um, malpractice, then um, you don't get to just move away from the problem. It's, it's gonna follow you. Invasion of privacy. So invasion of privacy is a tort, right? Remember crimes and torts that refer to a number of wrongs involving the use of otherwise private information. This is a HIPAA violation, okay? So all staff have to adhere to HIPAA regulations and recognize that any information a patient provides to the dental staff must remain confidential in the office, okay? If the patient says anything about having, um, you know, HIV, and then you know that that patient is going um, and dating a friend of yours, you cannot tell your friend that the patient has HIV, okay? You cannot do that. Um, even, I know you guys probably talk about that exact same scenario in uh, law and ethics, but invasion of privacy can involve prying into private affairs, communicating information related to the private life or affairs of a person without his or her permission, or appropriating the plaintiff's identity for commercial use. What does that mean? That means you sold their information. That's what that means. So, um, 
don't do that. Um, follow HIPAA regulations. Um, it's it's always a good idea to just be, you know, Kermit the Frog, sip it on your coffee. That's none of your business. Okay, don't spread information. Oh, the Good Samaritan Law. So the Good Samaritan Law is legislation that grants immunity for acts performed by a person who renders care in an emergency situation. Okay, this law does not provide protection for a negligent healthcare provider who is being compensated for services. So this is the part where, you know, if you are at the park and you see someone fall down it appears they're in going into cardiac arrest you know you go through the whole um abcs of cpr and you um accidentally break their rib then um then you're okay it's it's you know something that normally happens um and they cannot then sue you for breaking their rib as long as one, they really needed CPR, right? If you try to do CPR on someone who is merely laying on the ground after running, that's that's not the same thing, okay? That's that's assault and battery. Um, if you are providing a service, CPR, um, to someone in an emergency situation and you accidentally hurt them, accidental being the the, the keyword there, then um, then you won't be held liable. They can't sue you for that. Um, but if you are being paid for your services, like you're in your office and you provide CPR to someone, then um, typically, you, um, you're usually you're not being paid for CPR specifically. Um, but let's say, for instance, instead of CPR, because that's a tough one, um, let's say your patient starts to go into a seizure and you um, aren't able to you know, lie them back and remove this stuff and, and you try to insert something into their mouth or something like that um, while they're having that seizure and it ends up causing that person harm while you're providing services to them because you didn't do the proper medical emergency procedure, then you are held liable. Okay, so try to try to understand that the Good Samaritan law will protect you if you're doing the right thing, um, but it won't protect you if if you are being negligent in your care. Americans with Disabilities Act protects persons with some degree of disability from discrimination and requires dental offices to modify their facilities and make accommodations to allow access to dental care. This is really just aimed at preventing dentists from turning away patients who have a disability that the, that the dentist doesn't uh, want to deal with, okay? If the I mean, typically the, the rule is if the patient can get to your chair and you've provided all of, you know, the, the ramps for handicapped individuals and um, the, the hallway is wide enough and things like that um, for, you know, a walker or a wheelchair, if the patient is physically able to get to your chair, then you have to provide services for them. That's kind of the, the base thing you need to know there. Uh, the American... Americans with Disabilities Act is aimed at the elimination of discrimination against individuals with disabilities. Uh, you'll see this a little bit more often with patients who have some type of learning impairment or um, mental handicap. And so you want to be very careful with things like this um, as far as, um, you know, refusing care to someone like that. Um, obviously, you, you wouldn't, but um, you would, you need to speak with that person's um, power of attorney. Um, it's important for the office manager to obtain a copy of this act for the office and to routinely update the office policies as uh, as required based on the like how often the policy gets updated. Uh, you're gonna look in your book in box 4.7 to look at the provisions of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Computer security. So this is another thing with HIPAA. Um, HIPAA has evolved to include electronic uh, data. And so I think it's like EPA, which is electronic personal something, EPI, uh, maybe, I don't know. Um, the computer security refers to safeguards implemented to prevent and detect unauthorized access or deliberate damage to a computer system and data. A computer crime is a crime of a computer to commit an illegal act. Wow, I think that's that's pretty redundant. Anyway, um, in a dental office, the most common activity that would violate computer integrity is software theft or piracy. 
um, there are rules, HIPAA has rules, about how locked your computer has to be. Um, so typically, personal information needs to be protected by a double lock system. I know, I know you guys are all taking HIPAA. Um, you're going to have to take HIPAA as, uh, I think it's every other year you have to take HIPAA. Or it might be OSHA, you have to take every other year. But either way, you're going to take it very regularly. You're going to be very comfortable with these kinds of things. The first time you take it in your office, you really need to pay attention. There's always a test at the end, okay? Always. So um, everything about personal information has to be under double lock. For a computer information, that means that there has to be a password to get into the computer, like log into your desktop. And then there also has to be a password to log into your patient's files. Okay, so in our computer, there is a student login for the computer systems and there is a student log like each of you have your own student login to log into dentrix um that's considered a double lock um the same thing happens when you have paper charts you have to have it under a double lock which is why there is a separate room in the back of miss baby's office because charts are kept back there, um, which means that you would have to not only break into the clinic, you would also have to, well, you would have to break into Miss Baby's office, and then you would have to break into the chart room, and uh, I mean, maybe if you came in, well, I don't know, gosh, just don't, just don't steal people's information, just don't do that. Recruiting um, and hiring, so the dental office environment, the employer either the dentist who owns the office or the company who you know has an office manager is obligated to create an office environment that is respectful okay that is their obligation to you the employee if employees feel they have been subject to discrimination they can contact a local or regional office of the equal opportunity i'm sorry equal employment opportunity commission the eeoc for advice um this you wouldn't contact like the better business bureau right like you wouldn't go after a company like that because you're an employee um so you could talk to the equal employment opportunity commission and see is whatever this situation does it warrant you um pressing charges or doing whatever um so recruiting and hiring staff really needs to be done with care in these kinds of situations so that you have individuals that are um, going to follow the rules, they're going to be respectful of their coworkers and things like that. Um, when you have a disagreement with a coworker, it's important that you maintain that respectful environment. Sexual harassment. So uh, there's two slides here because this is a big topic. You guys are going to talk about this a lot in your life. Uh, so dental offices have to protect both their employees and patients from situations that could be considered sexual harassment. There's two types, quid pro quo and hostile environment. The one that employees typically see in the dental community is quid pro quo. Basically, there is you know, the dentist or, or not even the dentist. I mean, it could be another hygienist or it could be the front office person and they are like, hey, I'll give you a raise if we do these things, right? Quid pro quo, that's what it is. I do something for you to do something for me. That's what quid pro quo means. Uh, hostile environment is like someone who's making comments. That's kind of what a hostile environment would look like. Uh, harassment is defined as unwelcome, verbal, written, or physical conduct that creates a hostile or intimidating work, in, intimidating work environment um, quid pro quo sexual harassment occurs when an individual's submission, rejection of sexual advances, conduct of a sexual nature is used as basis for employment decisions. Hostile environment sexual harassment occurs when unwelcome sexual conduct unreasonably interferes with someone's ability to do his or her job or creates a hostile, intimidating, or offensive work environment. Um, so you don't necessarily have to be the target of sexual harassment in order for you to be sexually harassed if that makes sense so if you see you know the dentist make a comment for I'm I'm just terrible because I keep using the same the same thing the dentists are usually very good people um so you see someone in your office make a disparaging comment to someone else of a sexual nature and it offends you that's them or that person who makes the comment still is sexually harassing you, even if the person that the comment was directed to it doesn't feel harassed, still sexual harassment.
Okay, so the employee has several actions that he or she is subject to, um, if he or she is the subject of the harassing behavior. So one, you name the behavior, hold the harasser accountable for behavior, make honest, direct statements, demand the harassment stop, make it clear everyone has the right to be free of sexual harassment, stick to your plan to address the issue, reinforce your statement with strong, self-respecting body language. Um, also, respond at the appropriate level. Um, you know, don't blow things out of the water. If it was a comment, then a statement about your behavior is typically sufficient. Start small and then work your way up if it continues, right? End the interaction on your own terms. Create a written, dated summary of what occurred and inform your employer um, if obviously they're not the person you're talking to. Workplace bullying and disruptive behavior. So workplace bullying is repeated unreasonable actions of an individual or a group directed to an employee or a group of employees. Um, bullying is different from harassment. Harassment is offensive and unwelcome conduct, right? But bullying is intended to intimidate, degrade, humiliate, or undermine an individual, okay? so. Typically, harassment is more so um, associated with sexual harassment, while bullying is typically not of a sexual nature. Um, disruptive behavior can include profane, disrespectful language, throwing items such as uh, charts or instruments. Um, it says sexual comments, racial or socioeconomic slurs, um, angry outbursts, name calling, retaliation. These don't necessarily have to be about you. They don't have to necessarily be towards you. Um, they can just be made and you would feel um, disrespected or um, it would it would be disruptive. Um, there have been times where I've I've worked in, you know, a place and someone made a comment about race and it makes me uncomfortable, even if they're not talking about me or my race. So you want to be very careful about um, the things you say, even if even if they're a joke or even if they're, you know, like self um, ab about your own race. You don't necessarily want to talk about those kinds of things at all because you can make someone else uncomfortable. Um, so it's, it's typically a good idea to just keep those kinds of things off off of the, the topics of, of communication. Um, the ADA's principle of ethics and code of ethics, uh, code of conduct, specifically address disruptive behavior. Um, disruptive behavior has to be addressed. Um, a staff member may want to create a code of conduct for employees that's included in the staff handbook and uh, that's posted um, typically when something like this occurs. It's a good idea to speak to the person who said it, let them know that that's not okay, and then um, um, if they stop the behavior, then nothing further needs to happen. Respectful treatment of patients. So all staff members have to use language and demonstrate behaviors that could not be interpreted as disrespectful. Um, this one, it, uh, this one I have a hard time with because um, those patients are putting themselves in a very vulnerable position in order to uh, you know, come in and receive treatment. They trust you with their information and they trust you with um, being in a very vulnerable position, right? Like they lay down in the chair and open their mouth and and they let you put tiny little knives into their mouth. So um, if you're doing something like this, like you don't have just this utmost care and respect and compassion for your patients, then um, you're wrong, okay? You have to just completely be um, humbled by the amount of trust and and um, uh, just the trust that they give you. Offices may want to post a non-discrimination statements in the waiting room in order to uh, send a message to the patients that that kind of conduct wouldn't be tolerated and that the patient doesn't need to tolerate that. Um, and all staff should be reminded that their own personal or religious beliefs 
should not influence their treatment of patients. This is this is very important um, for many people. Um, you'll find that a lot of patients will state their religious beliefs or their political beliefs or all sorts of things that you may or may not agree with. And it is your job to redirect the conversation. It is your job to recommend treatment based on evidence-based practice, not how you feel about something and not how your religion feels about something. Um, demographic and health information uh, intake forms have to be updated in order to allow more options uh, beyond male and female or miss or mister. Um, so if your patient is either uh, doing gender reassignment or they're uh, gender neutral or fluid or anything like that, then it's important to um, ask them those kinds of questions and listen to them and then use the pronouns that they uh, want you to use. Ethical decision-making model. So specifically, I'm just going to read this to you. Specifically identify the ethical issue or dilemma. Dilemmas occur when a practitioner is caught between competing obligations and has to weigh two or more options to resolve the situation. Gather and review important facts or information pertinent to the situation. List alternatives that could be used to resolve the problem. Evaluate each alternative using ethical principles, codes, laws, and regulations to determine the best alternative. Make a decision choosing the best alternative that is ethically and legally appropriate, and then act on that decision, okay? Uh, routinely, it's a, it's a good idea to follow these steps whenever you feel like there is some sort of ethical dilemma in order to to move forward okay um, you can find this in your book um, in box 4.8 all right and that is it we have made it to the end of chapter four this is probably the longest chapter and it's the one you'll probably see the most questions on for your quiz if you have questions send me an email thanks